Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to those of you in Asia. Welcome again. Uh, I'm Karen Eggleston. I'm director of the Asia Health Policy Program here at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. And it is my privilege today to be in dialogue with our three distinguished guest speakers on the critical subject of China's changing demography. Few things are more important for health and resilient health systems than understanding the population served and how it's changing. Policymakers then can understand trends and better align incentives with adjustments to policies um, as needed, such as those on family planning, retirement, urbanization, hukou, childcare, taxation. Some would argue even policies related to innovation and entrepreneurship, all driven by changes in demography to some extent. So it is my honor to introduce today's experts in the order they will be speaking. First, we're delighted to welcome back, if only virtually, Professor Li Shuzhuo from Xi'an, China. Professor Li is currently University Distinguished Professor of Population and Development Policy Studies and Honorary Director of the Institute for Population and Development Studies at the School of Public Policy Administration of Xi'an Jiao Tong University. He's also a consulting professor at the Morrison Institute for Population and Resource Studies here at Stanford. He's a member of the Social Sciences Committee of the Ministry of Education of China. His research is focused on population and social development, as well as public policies in contemporary China, including population, gender imbalance, sustainable development, aging, health, migration, and integration. Second, we are honored to hear from Professor Tai Yong, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Professor Tsai's research and his many publications have focused on China's one-child policy and its implications for fertility and social policies. His work has contributed to emerging consensus and on the impact of that policy, including the associated impacts of low fertility and population aging, which are substantial. Uh, Professor Tsai continues to monitor fertility policies in the post-one-child era with a new focus on international comparisons on sustained low fertility and population aging, both from a micro perspective about individual responses and family dynamics, and from a macro perspective about social welfare regimes and public transfers. And third, we're delighted to welcome back Professor Wang Feng, who is Professor of Sociology at the University of California, Irvine, and an adjunct professor of sociology and demography at Fudan University in Shanghai. He has done extensive research on global social and demographic changes, comparative population and social history and social inequality with a focus on China. He's the author of multiple books and his research articles have been published in venues including Population and Development Review, Demography, Science, Journal of the Economics of Aging, Journal of Asian Studies and the China Journal. He has served on expert panels for the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, and as a senior fellow and the director of the Brookings Tsinghua Center for Public Policy. His work and views have appeared in many media outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Financial Times, Economist, CNN, BBC, and others. After their presentations, we'll have some time for discussion. So please put your questions in the Q&A function on Zoom, and we will get to as many of those as possible. Now I turn it over to Professor Li Shuzhuang. Hi, good morning. And uh, uh, thank you, Karen, for inviting me to participate in this very, very interesting um, webinar. And uh, uh, I'm happy to come back to Stanford virtually. So to talk about uh, uh, China's uh, changing demography. Uh, let me uh, share my presentation with you. Okay, so uh, let me start talking about uh, China's changing demography because we have three speakers here. So I'm mostly focusing on the uh, total population and the sex ratio issues. And the other two speakers, we talk about more about the aging, urbanization, fertility, and mortality issues. So let me uh, start with the uh, uh, background. So the population census uh, uh, is a 10-year uh, a work for Chinese uh, government. So from 1409 to 2021, China conducted uh, seven census. The last census was conducted in 2020, uh, the seventh population census. So let me uh, talk about a little bit uh, more about uh, the, what is census in China. Uh, first, that uh, the object of the Chinese census 
uh, it's including the you know, Chinese citizens, even who are outside of China, but not per permanent residents of other countries. But uh, it doesn't include foreigners inside China. So this is a uh, Chinese uh, census object. And the content of the census is very similar to most of the uh, countries. I'm not going to talk about it in detail. And the, the, for the last census in November, uh, 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 seventh census in 2020, the reference time is November 1st. So that is uh, uh, what we call the, the standard time. And the, for China census, we have a, a, a long table for everybody. And then uh, for short, short table for everybody, then we have a, a long table for uh, what, what we call a 10% or something. So 10% of the people and household will participate in a long table. Uh, a long table. So uh, we have three, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, webinar, uh, for this presentation, I think that we need to share three key definitions for this uh, talk. First, uh, because in China, we have a, a household system. This is unique in the world. So we have a distinguished, we have a, a difference uh, different uh, uh, definition about uh, who are the racist, racist people, local racist people, and who are the local uh, permanent residents. So the different, the key point is that uh, if you are staying in one place for more than six months, even if you don't have household registration, then you are regarded as a local person, as a permanent resident. So that is the one key definition. It doesn't go to the next page. Uh, how do we go to the next page? Uh, So the other two key definition is that what is the total population? What is national population? Because in China has three uh, specific uh, uh, administrative, uh, special administrative region, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. So that the total population includes all provinces and uh, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. But the national population only includes mainland Chinese population, but it doesn't include uh, uh, foreigners. So, so that, uh, that is the uh, uh, three key definition. So the second point I need to mention that uh, because Chinese census data is already available to most of the researchers, but the published data is still very limited. So all findings and all uh, uh, facts report today uh, for me is based on the uh, publicly uh, available data. So I have two, uh, uh, two parts to share with you. First part will be national population. So number one issue I want to share is that uh, the, total, the national population size. So this figure, the figure one, shows you the national population of each public census over the last uh, 70 years in China. And uh, this figure, I have three ob observations I want to share with you. First, the Chinese population is continuous, continuously increasing so the last uh, uh, census, the Chinese population is around 1.4 billion. So that is uh, number one. The second is that uh, the, we see uh, a continually decline in the average annual growth rate. And especially over the last 20 uh, years, and uh, the population growth rate is around uh, 5 per thousand. So number two. The number three is that uh, we see we are going to see a uh, population decline very soon. So probably last year, the population growth was almost around zero. So this year, uh, year 2022, uh, we probably see uh, for the very first time in Chinese history, in the peace, peace time that uh, Chinese population is going to decline. So we're going to see uh, population uh, decline and a negative population growth. That's the kind of issue in China. And this, this figure too shows you the uh, population distribution by province. And we see that uh, on the left side, we see that uh, uh, provinces in uh, Delta River and the Yangtze River area, like Guangdong, Shandong, Henan, and Jiangsu, you see a very, very large population size. And especially in uh, Guangdong, number one, about uh, uh, 120, uh, uh, 130 pop, uh, million population. But on the other hand, on the right side, you see like Ningxia and Qinghai and Tibet, their population is only a couple of million. So that is a very sharp contrast 
or the population distribution in, in China by provinces. And if you look at the regional population spatial distribution, you see this is a map of China. You see that there's a line, what we call the Hu Huayun line, and it's also called the Ai Hui from northeast to Tengchong, uh, southwest line. That this line on the left side in the west part, only 5% population. On the uh, right side is about 95% uh, uh, of population. And this kind of uh, spatial distribution has maintained around 100 years in China. So that is uh, also a spatial po uh, population distribution. Uh, one more uh, uh, figure to show you uh, the uh, population change uh, in number and also in growth rate over the last decade by province. You see, mostly on the left side, you see the eastern coast area, you see the largest population growth in persons. On the other side, uh, the northeast, northeast areas, Heilongjiang, Jilin, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Liaoning provinces, you see a sharp decline in both population size and growth rate. That is on the right side. What is behind is a, a spatial and a regional distribution by province in China is mostly because of the changing functions and the, of the cities. So in China, we have a kind of clarification of a tier one, tier two, tier three, and tier four, five cities. Mostly, for, for instance, Beijing, Shanghai, and uh, Guang, uh, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen are tier one, including the major cities like Xi'an and, uh, and Zhengzhou, et cetera. And at the same time, we, we have many, many small cities. So from this figure, it's in Chinese, I'm sorry, but uh, it shows you on the left side, it's the large cities, what we call the tier one city. On the right side, it's on the tier five city, you see that over the last 10 years, you see a big and a sharp increase, both in size and in growth rate of large cities. But in smaller cities, you see a decline in numbers and also in the growth rate. So, so the kind of the, of the dis, uh, spatial and the regional distribution of Chinese population uh, change, you see, is mostly because of the urbanization and also floating population. The number two, uh, two part I, I'm going to share with you is about the sex ratio. So here, the data is mostly from census and, uh, and also China statistical yearbook and also the major figures on uh, 2020 published in census. First, when you look at the sex ratio of the national population, uh, the total sex, sex ratio, this figure shows you over the last 70 years, starting from 1953 to year 2020, the sex ratio of the overall population. You see that for most of countries that uh, the overall population, uh, population sex ratio should be around 100. But for China, that's that nothing that has never happened. So over the last 20, uh, 50, 70 years, the population sex ratio is almost around 105, more than 105. But especially over the so it's higher than the normal level. But especially over the last 20 years, it's a decline. So right now, it's around 105. So this is number one. Number two, we look at the the rural urban uh, differences. So in year 2010, 10 years ago, the urban and rural area is almost the same around 105 for the overall population uh, sex ratio. But for the last census the year 2020, that we see that uh, a decline in urban area with a sharp increase around 108 in rural area. So that is the uh, uh, number, two, number uh, that is the uh, sex ratio by rural and urban uh, division. And when we look at the sex ratio of national population by uh, different uh, provinces, the thing that is also very interesting in both in the uh, level and, above, and also in the change. So we have three observations. The first that the one third of the provinces exist the national level, 105. The second uh, important issue is that uh, for the most of the eastern coast areas, like Guangdong, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, and Shanghai, the sex ratio increased. And then we look at the northern province, especially uh, uh, north uh, east area, Heilongjiang, Liaoning, and Jilin, 
they declined. This mostly because of the outmigration of the young adults to, uh, from the northeast area to other provinces. Then we go, go to see the sex ritual births. So we see that sex ritual births, uh, starting from 1953, increased from normal level until to the year 2000, 220, then start declining. The current level is around 110. So but still all more uh, higher than normal level, but still, uh, uh, but it's much uh, declined. The sex ritual, sex ritual at age zero to four, it's almost same pattern. But it's interesting when we look at the consequences of the uh, sex selection and sex ratio at birth. When we look at uh, the year 20 uh, to 49 at a marriageable age, then we see that uh, the problem is mostly that uh, the sex ratio increased between 2010 to 2020, and especially in the age group of 2034. If we go to the breakdown by rural and urban di uh, differences, we see that the problem is more seriously in uh, rural, in urban, in rural area, especially around uh, at age 20 to 34. So marriage squeeze and the marriage market is a big issue in China. So Chinese government and Chinese society is very much concerned about the marriage market, bachelors and the increasing uh, price. So this is the issue. When we look, uh, finally, we look at the uh, sex ratio at age, uh, by major age group for young people, middle aged group, and uh, old people, we see that uh, sex ratio is high in young people, but it's lower in the old people. So that is the uh, uh, national trend of the uh, sex ratio by uh, major age group. So, in short, let's see that uh, for a sex ratio uh, part, we see that. Uh, the sexual, sexual birth, the sex selection continues to decline. It's not no, no longer a big issue yeah, because it's a big issue over the last 30 years, but uh, currently it's not a big issue. But the con consequences of gender imbalance and gender selection are becoming more and more serious in China. And then we see a, a big difference and disparity in, in rural and urban and regional differences. And we need speci specifically to pay more attention to rural areas in the future. The third that uh, the governance of a gender imbalance should shift from coping with sex selection to addressing to the consequences and risk of sex selection. So that's my uh, part of the uh, talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Karen, uh, for organizing the panel and uh, for inviting us. And I truly uh, looking forward to the discussion. Uh, my, uh, uh, as Shuzhou says, Shuzhou obviously has the advantage of saying the real data. And so far, what we outsiders having uh, only been uh, you know, provided with so-called public version that is published by the National Bureau of Statistics. So what I'm going to uh, say in today's discussion is actually provide a demographer's, perspe demographer's perspective, say, when the data is not perfect, when data are not available, what can we assess the situation? So let me start with a screenshot I taken from New York Times. You know, this is my source. You can say my bias. I, you know, I rely on that uh, news outlet to get my uh, news. And you can say the headline is obvious on the fertility side that it's China is facing a crisis, and uh, related to that, that's the aging problem. And then you know, I, you know. You know, so here this is like uh, an article published by New York Times on May 11th, 2021, after the National Bureau of Statistics uh, of China released its uh, 2020 census data. And uh, I would have to say that the reporters did an excellent job summarizing the key findings and key takeaways. So the question, you know, in, in a way, I try to say is. What can we demographer add on to uh, uh, to this with this limited amount of data? You know, because everyone has access to more or less the same kind of data, and uh, the conclusion seems like quite clear. So here's what I'm going to uh, provide you. Let's start with something. So as I said, the headline has been on the fertility side, and we have 
two lines here. One is the number of uh, births per year from 1950 all the way to 2021, last year. And the second line is the number of deaths, again, annual number of deaths. And you can see the two lines shows very different trends. Let's start with the death side. Death side is very simple. You see the slow, gradual rise of number of deaths from uh, about 7 million, uh, 7 million ish all the way now is over 11 million ish. So this is like sea level rising under global warming situation. And they, we say the aging problem is China's face. It's slowly in a, a, a rise. At the same time, on the fertility side, we say the major drop of number of births, we are approaching roughly about a 10 million mark that, you know, if we cross that mark, yes, as you just said, most likely that we will see the first time negative growth over the past uh, 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 half a century. So that's the burden on the fertility side. But I want to call your attention to say the demographic side of the story. We see three echoes. First, after the China's Great Leap Forward famine, there was a major rebound of number of births, and the, it reached almost 30 million in 1962, uh, 1963, and stayed at 27 million-ish for a few years until when China started a uh, long, later longer fuel policy, and we say fertility uh, rapidly declined, and the number of births declined to roughly 17, 18 million by the end of 19th century. Then we see the echoing effect. Yes, the one child policy was in place in the 1980s, but the number of births increased anyway because the, just like the baby boom in the United States, we see a baby boom echo. There that was an echo of baby boom in the 1980s. And then after that, we see a baby bust echo. Okay, now we're basically seeing a, the third wave of this process that after 2010, you say the zigzagging of the number and then there's a major bust. The bust is an echoing process to the uh, 1990s bust. Okay, so that's, that's the headline and Chinese government clearly tried to reverse the trend, try to now in, not only encourage in some, time, in some ways, try to you know, uh, twist arm to people say, you need to have two kids, you need to have three kids. It's not just for you, it's for our collective future, just like when they announced the one child box. Now, one, a little bit of detail I want to provide you is that after the release of 2000, uh, 2020 census, China adjusted its, the, the number I pr presented here, the number of births was published in the Chinese uh, annual statistical yearbook. So it's published year after year. And after the release of the 2020 census, they adjusted the number of births for the years between 2011 to 2019. And you see a little bit of increase, this part, the total amount is roughly 10 million. Okay, so the census tells us that the Chinese government has been underestimating its fertility, underestimating its births. And that indicates that even a country like China, it you know, seems like it should have very good account of its people if we, you know, it can track each and every one and uh, it has a sovereign system, has a you know, national ID system, it still has difficulty of counting its younger population. Oh, not actually, not just younger population. And if that were true, so let me just follow up with this, uh, this slide. This is 10 year survival ratio divide, uh, separated by, by male and female. Basically, the advantage of being a demographer is that we can keep counting the same people again and again because we know we can only age one year at a time. That 10 years later, if I'm 40, was 40 years old 10 years ago, I should be 50 years old by now. So we can balance, we can check. And what we saw for the youngest cohort that was counted for the first time in the 2000 census, they were born in uh, 2010 census, they were born in 2010, 2009, 2008. They were uncount, undercounted severely that, you know, reached 25, almost 30%. But the counting gets better when they age to school year ages. And uh, the other interesting phenomenon we saw is that apparently that the 2010 census 
overcome people in this uh, later teenage, young adult, adolescent years. Partly, I suspect it has something to do with how Chinese census count its people. It, it, it double counted because when people are, were at home and when people were at school, they were counted at both place. The one main major innovation or one major change of the 2020 census is that for the first time, Chinese national census included the national ID in the census form to avoid this double count. Okay. And some, uh, we might also see some undercounting of the 20, uh, uh, 20 year old in the 2010 census. After that, the data is largely consistent. And there's, there might be some interesting age heaping around the year 10 ish, but overall, you know, beyond the 30 years old, the Chinese data quality is reasonable. So, yes, the data, you know, we should not take Chinese data at its face value. We need the demographic expertise to understand the process. So, the lesson here is that, you know, if we look at the 2020 census, Chinese fertility probably was not as low as many have feared. And if this same undercounting pattern happened in the 2020 census, we, I think that the fee, right now the, 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 the concern that fertility would drop quickly drop to below 10 million, it's probably a little bit overblown. But you know, we know, as my previous graph have, have, has shown, that there's a strong echoing demographic, uh, demographic effect on go. So let me bring to the uh, to the to the mortality side again because you know the census actually presumably should be able to provide us a good you know uh, should be a, 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 a provide us the foundation to create a live table at least the interessential live table okay and but because the data quality is not excellent I'm in relying on demographic model I put the 10 year survival ratio from 50 to 54, that a year age range, and age them six, uh, uh, 10 years to 60 to 64. And I map it to the uh, human mortality life table database, as well as, as the most, uh, uh, mostly commonly used uh, life table uh, database called the model life table. And you can see if Chinese data were reasonable for at least for this old age group, we would expect. China's fertility in this 10 year range between 2010 to 2020 would be about 77, 78 ish in that range, or somewhere between 76 to 81, even 82 ish, that kind of range. Yeah. So here is the published data, you know, data released by Chinese government. Interestingly, Chinese government, you know, yes, they, they construct the, the live table. I think Suzhou might be contributed to that, but they never tell us how they adjusted it. Okay, and we can see here from 1981 all the way to 2000, uh, 2020 that the Chinese, there is a remarkable increase of life expectancy from 60 uh, 67.8, and by 2020, uh, it's now at 77.3. That's 10 year increase in four decades. That's truly remarkable. Okay, and if we look at the uh, annual uh, uh, the change per decade, we can see there was a huge increase uh, between 2000 to 2015, about three years per decade. And the latest number, the official number, saying that it, uh, it increased another 1.9 years between 2015 to 2020. But if my assessment of this interstitial uh, data analysis were true, this would be an underestimate. You know, it's I don't see a, a, a slowdown at least based on the data what I have been saying, and I suspect the reason for this underestimate could be because for the first time China put a, a life expectancy increase in its 14th, fifth year plan. The, projection that the plan is to increase uh, another one year in the next five years or in the current five year plan. Okay, so that's on third. And uh, so given that I'm uh, bringing uh, an article I uh, worked together with Wang Feng and Shen Ke published in 2018 and we try to assess the uh, demographic as well as the policy effect on uh, uh, 
non-China as well well system. As three panels showing here, that is how much of the policy change and how much of demographic change will affect how much uh, money China will spend on education, on healthcare, and on pension. The, uh, the simple line of story is that the, the the demographic change is going to be slow. The most uh, important trend we say is whatever the demographic side is going to happen in the next two to three decades, the overall spending on healthcare will be increased and there you will see a major, major increase in the uh, pension spending from roughly 4% uh, percent ish all the way to 12 to 13 percent ish by 2040. And if we combine them together, I put it, you know, this is probably easier to say that the, the demographic side of the story is that that's not that much, unless China see a drastic increase of fertility, uh, a drastic change of dem, uh, uh, dem, uh, the, the, the welfare regime, the demography story is a slow change, just like, uh, as we saw, that just like sea level, level rising, gradually, the spending on welfare will go from roughly 10% in 2015 of GDP to close to 30% by 2060. And because what we did when we did the analysis was using the UN's projection. And UN has been basically projecting China's uh, mortality reduction at roughly one year per decade's increasing life expectancy. So that, you know, it, that means that we are most likely to have been underestimating the effect of aging on Chinese society. So to summarize, I make very three, uh, uh, simple points. First, you know, yes, even a country like China still you know, has had uh, difficulty in getting accurate count of its population, and that presents huge uncertainty in how we assess its demographic situation. Having said that, my assessment is that the 2020 census data is, seems to be better than previous ones. So that gives us some certainty. Okay. Second, the headline has been low fertility, but the situation may be not as bad. And nevertheless, you know, we know that the demographic side of the story is very clear. The echoing effect is going to be happen. And the social side of the story, you keep hearing that with higher, with quick rising of uh, 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 urbanization and the rapid expanding of higher education that people are delaying the marriage and delaying the childbearing. So we will say China repeat and follow what it has observed in its neighboring uh, countries. And the last one, and I, I, I just said that just to reiterate, China has true, uh, saying a truly really remarkable increase in life expectancy. And uh, it's the latest data shows it's continued to increase at a fast pace and much faster than many people have anticipated, much faster than the UN has projected. That means we have been underestimating the challenge of China's population age. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tsai. And now for our third speaker, Professor Wang Fu. Thank you, Karen, for organizing uh, this uh, timely uh, panel uh, to get us together. Um, uh, being a demographer doing a demographic work, it um, uh, comes with many pleasures. Uh, one of them is you work actually with numbers and uh, the numbers they repeat as Tsai-Yong, Professor tsai -Yong just said, they are people are counted again and again. So you have the um, the opportunity to um, to cross exam and uh, to check for consistencies. And as we've seen both from Su Zhe and the science work, uh, we get a clearer uh, picture over time. Well, the second part of the fun is um, uh, you actually discover uh, many uh, interesting um, puzzles, uh, if I may, uh, comment on Tsai Yong's uh, work just a little uh, while ago. Um, fertility, uh, there are surprises. So fertility may not be as low as we, what we have been concerned with. It is certainly low. It's not, we're not saying fertility is you know, above 1.6, 1.8. 
or even uh, close to the replacement le uh, level of 2.1 uh, per couple. So fertility has been low. And, uh, but however, it might not be as low as uh, what is being reported. And uh, so which means that aging, if we measure the share of the elderly in the population uh, may not be as severe because we, we have more uh, young people uh, hidden in the population than we previously believed. However, at the other, on the other hand, as Tsai Yong also showed, um, life expectancy increase uh, is faster, perhaps is faster than what the government just reported. And um, that actually is counterintuitive. On the one hand, we think that uh, a longer life is uh, a happy thing that we all celebrate. So uh, if we find a longer life expectancy than was reported, that is to be celebrated. But in terms of population aging, when you have more elderly living in the population than what you uh, report, that means, as Tsai Yun showed, uh, again, in that paper we uh, co-published uh, a number of years ago, uh, that the number of elderly who would be entitled or expected to receive pension um, would uh, be larger than what is believed. Uh, for instance, if you follow the projection by uh, the UN, which always tends to be conservative, both for its fertility, it tends to be high, and for uh, mortality, it tends to, uh, to give a lower uh, improvement in life expectancy. Uh, one last note before I share with another uh, set of interesting puzzles is that uh, when Tsai Yong uh, reported uh, the share of the GDP to be spent on pension or on social benefits, um, we need to bear in mind that's the share of the GDP. So if by let's like, say 2035 or 2040, uh, within 20 years, the share goes up to 20 or 25% of GDP, and that is the total share of government revenue uh, currently. So currently, roughly about 25% of Chinese government, well, uh, Chinese government revenue is about 25%, give or take a, a, a couple of points of the national GDP. So if pension and the social benefits demand because of aging largely increases to 25%, that has huge implications. Now, uh, let me share with you just one uh, set of uh, puzzles and this follows uh, Professor Li Su uh, earlier discussion on urbanization. So in the last two decades uh, after 2000, uh, we have seen the fastest uh, urbanization process in China. And the process was especially uh, rapid in the last 10 years from 2010 to 2020. So uh, we're looking at, uh, let me put this on the side. Uh, uh, so we're looking at about 15% increase in the share of population counted as urban. Okay, Li Shuzhou, Professor Li Shuzhou explained uh, how people were counted. So these were residents counted as urban. So uh, in the last census, previous one, before 2020 in 2010, uh, still China had less than half of its population. It was getting close. It was half, smaller than half of its population. Uh, that was classified as urban. And by 2020, about 64%. And that's 200, more than 225 million new urban residents just in 10 years, right? So that's a huge uh, increase. But this is only part of the story. Uh, if we look at uh, employment, I don't have the 2020 numbers yet, I have 2019. Um, Roughly 75% uh, of uh, Chinese working population are working in non-agricultural professions. So um, 
one concern or hope people have right now is how China could continue to rely on urbanization to drive its economic growth. And uh, so if we look at employment, um, this is what I call the, uh, the other Chinese urbanization. Uh, you already have three quarters of the labor force out of the uh, other farming, out of agriculture uh, uh, work. And in other words, if you look at the 64% of urban population, resident population, you think you still have a third, um, more than a third of the Chinese population yet to be urbanized. But if you look at employment, you only have a quarter, right? And uh, here I don't uh, have the numbers to share with you on the age and the sex composition of those who are left in the countryside. They tend to be more feminine and tend to be older. So, uh, and that's another urbanization. Now, I think the biggest challenge is the next one. Um, this is the population that was counted over time, including year 2020. Uh, they were counted as the population with local, uh, with local household registration or hukou. And so if we look at, that's the bottom line. So if we look at the share of population with a local hukou, and China still has under 50% of its population with a uh, urban hukou in the, press, in the place of residence, right? So what does this mean? The difference between the residential population that people counted their census or in surveys early on as urban, and then the people who have a local hukou, uh, the difference is about 18%. And that is 260 million people. Uh, what does this mean? Um, <clears throat> these are the people who do not have uh, the, uh, the full provision of local social benefits from uh, uh, education to um, healthcare and to pension, right? And um, Li Shu Zhuo pointed out uh, the rapid increase in what's called the first tier uh, cities. And so there, there have been a lot of reforms and relaxations in uh, getting people with a local hukou but um, for mega city, large cities with five million and more people, uh, the restrictions remain. So those are the 19 large cities. They still have uh, the hukou restriction and they count for over 200 million people. So I think the story here, just to add to uh, the, the puzzles on fertility, um, mortality is that uh, China faces a, uh, a, 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 a interesting and I think a challenging uh, future in terms of urbanizing uh, its population. And uh, the issue now is not just to give people a piece of paper to say you are uh, a urban population, you, you have the urban population status. And the issue is whether the uh, cities, especially these large cities, have uh, the financial means to provide uh, social benefits to those who do not have hukou. So we don't have time to uh, discuss uh, you know, the implications and the challenges here uh, in depth, uh, but I just want to raise uh, this as a one of the dimensions of um, the demographic changes in China, um, and that's going to uh, to be a uh, interesting uh, challenge for the years to come. Um, I would uh, let me end uh, here since I think we are uh, behind, and so we can discuss uh, all the presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all three of you for such informative presentations. We'll move now to some questions. Um, 
starting first with a couple of that have come in. Uh, you touched upon some issues and um, there are many successes and many challenges given the changing in the population structure. So maybe um, starting with Professor Li Shuzhuo, um, you're an expert in the gender imbalance issue, having contributed to the Care for Girls program and so on. Maybe you could spend a few more minutes talking about um, the issue of the marriage squeeze. And if you have any thoughts about the relationship between those changing demographics and the increasing education of the population and whether that squeeze is particularly on the lower educated men in rural areas, et cetera. Any thoughts on that? Uh, Karen, uh, I actually prepared uh, some comments about the Chinese uh, population and especially the what is concerned by the Chinese society and the Chinese government. So I think it might be interesting to share with the audience about uh, what is currently going on in the public and in the policy very briefly. So I want to uh, share with you some of, some of the slides. Okay, what's, uh, when, we, when we look forward, what's going to happen? What's happening right now? <clears throat> I have some uh, slides to share with you. The first is that uh, what is concerned in China, in both government, society, and the common uh, regular uh, people. I think the number one issue is aging population. So aging is not very much discussed today, but it's the number one issue in China. So everybody's worries about aging, pension, who's carry you, who will carry you, who will be cared, who will be missed, who will be left behind. So what is, kind of services, where's money from? So a lot of issue. The second is about uh, low fertility. So everybody is worried about uh, who will be married, who will give birth, how many births, who will care birth, grandparents, government, community. So it's a low fertility issue. I already noticed that just, um, a couple questions related to low fertility. I noticed that uh, Tsai Yong said that uh, low fertility is not so low. But uh, the common consensus is that uh, it's really low, and at least it's under replacement level. The third is that the negative population growth. Probably you, you, you think about uh, the overall population uh, decline in China, but the real problem right now is that for the smaller areas and also for the negative for the uh, rural areas, especially for far remote areas, population decline is a big issue. So last year I visited a, a, a couple of uh, provinces and the cities and the rural areas. Uh, everywhere you go, except Shanghai and Beijing, everywhere you go, government worried about population decline. It's very hard to hire new labor. It's very hard to find young workers. So this is also a big issue. Then we have a a lot of other issues related to the long-term consequences, like gender imbalance, low fertility, aging. So that's a issues in China. So strategy, I hope that the audience also need to know that, so what is the current strategy in China coping with the population issues? Probably you need to think about the family planning. That is the past. Right now, the number one population strategy is what we call active response to population aging strategy. This was from, uh, announced by the Chinese government in year 2020. So the population aging strategy is not only for aging, it includes low fertility, it includes three child policy, it includes uh, the urbanization, it includes population uh, aging issues. So it's kind of number one national publishing uh, strategy. Then we have other publishing strategy related to the uh, population like what we call balanced population development strategy, has China, new urbanization strategy, and three child policy and support measures. Uh, for the, regarding these kind of population strategies, we have a lot of uh, new policies and a new, new re regulations. For instance, uh, the three child policy is issue, they encourage marriage, encourage childbirth, but the problem is still there. So the government, for instance, the last uh, 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 policy just released uh, last month that uh, the national government have a special individual income tax deduction 
for the care of infant under three years old. So right now we have special uh, deduction for tax in child, child, in, in child birth, child care, in elder care, and also in the education. So for everybody in three major groups, young people, middle-aged people, and old people, they all are under tax deduction, a special program. So that's some kind of new measures that the government has been working hard to try to cope, try to cope with the aging and the low fertility. So what I'm uh, uh, seeing in the future that uh, uh, I'm observing the Chinese society that uh, the government and society is trying to do a lot of issue, uh, uh, hard work, try to cope with the population change. First is a shift to the population center economic growth and a social development model. So, so, so like aging issues, like uh, uh, pension system, like a uh, low fertility care uh, system, like care system. The second is that uh, pay attention to the consequences of gender imbalance, imbalance, and also especially the gender imbalance relationship between the, with aging, fertility, urbanization. The third is that uh, we are trying to improve the family development capacity and especially its ability to cope with uh, vulnerability, risk, and to, by promoting family policy system. So, so in the past, we only have a family planning system, but right now the family policy system is kind of a new issue. It's on the uh, uh, horizon. The, the last is that we are focusing more on the vulnerable groups and try to strengthen their resilience, in, try to improve their capacity to deal with Resilient, in improving the resilience, resilience in dealing with emergency events and risk. So that's kind of a, a, a observation. Uh, uh, as Karen just mentioned that um, uh, a lot of issues, uh, gender imbalance is uh, one issue, especially over the past uh, 30 years. But uh, currently it's not a single issue very important. It's kind of complexity. So all issues are uh, intervened together and uh, for instance, that aging is something related to the bachelor issues. And the bachelor is, is related to high price, uh, bright price. And the high bright price is related to the market market. So a lot of interesting issues. I hope that, uh, that uh, the audience uh, may know that uh, the demography in China is changing very, very quickly. And uh, it's changing every month. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So um, maybe if, yeah, if you want to stop sharing the screen, we'll have yeah, some yeah. questions next for Professor Tsai Yong. There's a question um, came in, in your view, was the huge decline in births in 2021 due primarily to COVID or other factors or both equally? And given that 2022 is a less auspicious year of the tiger, do you expect the baby bus to continue? Daniel Goodkind has asked. Professor Tsai? Okay, uh, yeah, I think that's a question a lot of people have been asking ever since the very beginning of the COVID to say, hey, are we going to see a baby boom or baby bust? The situation in China, that because the lockdown, you know, the, the COVID happened early on in China and lockdown was not that particular long and most people's life went back to more or less to uh, normal rather quickly. So I think that the direct effect of COVID from for 2021 was, should be relatively speaking small. You know, now China is going through another round, you know, but small, still relatively speaking isolated. If I look at, uh, with my social connections in China, yes, people in Shanghai are, are in lockdown, but the people in my hometown are totally free to do whatever they want to do. So I don't think that at least we don't have say the direct connection between COVID and fertility in China yet. Uh, but in longer term, COVID could, could certainly change people's perspective on how important family is and uh, how they should deal with all kinds of social stress. I'm, you know, I'm actually uh, on the other side of the question is you know the auspicious years of year of tiger or year of dragon. You know, based on my, you know, looking at the data over the past uh, half a century, China, Chinese are not as auspicious, you know, as uh, religious, you know, reading those uh, signs that much, at least 
maybe it's in certain regions, but overall across China, it seems like even out quite a bit. Yes, there's a tiny bit of dragging effect in Taiwan and in mainland China. Other than that, it's really not that you know instrumental uh, an instrumental factor in people's decision whether they want uh, when uh, uh, whether they want to have a child. Thank you. Maybe next question for Professor Wang Feng. We've had several come in related to questions of uh, migration and immigration. Anyone can feel free to answer, but let me try to combine some of the questions that come in. Um, how do different levels of government balance between immigration, encouraging more childbirths and automation to deal with these trends? And um, uh, Wang Feng, in your presentation, you talked about localized financing makes integration difficult. Maybe you could talk a little bit more related to that and how that's related to migration. And finally, we have a question coming in given low fertility, could immigration become large enough to make up at least for some of the low fertility or the rapid population decline we might see? as has in much in Europe and North America, has the share of the population that is not Chinese nationals increased significantly over the last few decades? Professor Wong, if you wanna take a stab at any of those questions, please. Well, let me get to uh, the issue of uh, immigration first, because that's easy. And the answer is no. Um, with a caveat, that is, uh, if you are uh, Irene Gu, and uh, you can earn a Olympics uh, gold medal for China and you are an exception. Otherwise, uh, you are not welcome. China has a long way to go, uh, not only because it's a large population, uh, immigration um, in terms of number would only play a very small role, but the China also has a very highly uh, utilitarian approach uh, to uh, immigration. Uh, it's not just China. I mean, the United States uh, has, or countries try to attract uh, talent. Uh, but the Chinese case, China has a long way to go uh, because uh, it has a, uh, a fa fairly highly selective, very narrow um, approach in terms of talent recruitment. And uh, if you are looking at uh, what's going on in Shanghai. Uh, I think some people probably read on social media and uh, what appeared to be a joke, uh, but it was not a joke. Someone uh, in the building said, oh, we could probably eat this black guy uh, in, uh, in our building, right? And so there was a t-shirt made about uh, saying, don't eat me. Um, so there's a lot of racism and China being a a homogeneous and uh, you know very chauvinistic ethnocentric society. Uh, it had, with given the current nationalistic sentiment, uh, I think uh, socially uh, it's uh, it's quite uh, challenging to do more immigration. So that's the easy part. Uh, now uh, let me get back to the uh, the issue of uh, of low fertility and uh, financing. Um, uh, Li Shuzhuo pointed out uh, a number of government uh, initiatives to uh, try to address uh, the demographic change, especially aging, low fertility in China. Uh, these are all top-down um, initiatives. And uh, also Professor Li Shuzhuo noted, uh, what we've seen is a outcome of complex process. And let me just give one example again using the uh, 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 numbers. Uh, what we've seen in the last 10 years or 20 years is this concentration or migration of people, especially young people, to large cities, to tier one cities, right? And that's where the job opportunities are. And that's also where the most restrictive uh, settlement HUCO uh, policies are, and that's also where the housing cost is the highest, right? And so uh, none of the, the, uh, the government measures to address high, uh, low fertility 
uh, young people postponing marriage uh, is on lowering the housing cost, right? So uh, that is going to, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's something that's working on the, the ground. So it's not something that can be addressed just with documents from the government. A housing cost is high in part because local governments rely on selling land to uh, as part of the revenue. You know, there are some estimates like a quarter of the local government revenue uh, comes from land sale, right? And in regarding to uh, giving benefits to local residents, we know 90% uh, of the uh, spending of social uh, social benefit spending, government actual government spending, uh, is uh, by local government. So, um, and only half of the income that comes from uh, the local government, right? So the, the total physical income uh, revenue. Uh, so basically, the spending is uh, well, revenue is half half central government, the local government, but spending is mostly local government. So. Uh, how would local government be able to provide? I'm just giving you these, you know, uh, 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 choices. So how could the local government provide benefits for the migrants, the migra migrants to their cities, large cities, uh, if uh, at the same time they cannot sell the land? But if they sell the land to have the revenue which is not a process that can continue indefinitely, by the way. Uh, so if they do not sell, uh, rep, do not sell uh, land to uh, raise revenue, so how could they uh, pay for the benefits? But if they sell the land and then the housing cost is going to be higher and higher. So that is the kind of dilemma that um, our, one of the dilemmas China faces uh, in dealing with migration, urbanization and the social integration and uh, high ho housing cost and fertility. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on those questions or the issue uh, of integration? Uh, uh, Karen, I want to follow uh, Wangtun's comments on uh, immigration. I also noted that uh, uh, two questions are regarding the immigration policy and program in China. The first that uh, the Chinese census uh, does include uh, counting foreigners, but it's not in, regarded as a national population, and total, total population. So we have a special uh, short, short table to count, to interview the uh, foreigners who are living and working inside China mainland for more than three months. So that doesn't include the travelers and the business people, but it's mostly for uh, people working in China and studying in China. So that's one response to the question uh, that uh, one, one audience uh, raised about uh, uh, why we're not including, but we do. But uh, so we have special report on the uh, foreigners in China, immigration. The second that uh, regarding the uh, immigration is in immigration is, uh, it was not issue in China in the past. But right now, especially over the last 10 years, immigration is the issue in China. In responding to, because China is a, especially economic development has become more and more important globally. So more and more workers are coming to China, including investment, business people, education, so are coming to China. So, 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 so in responding to addressing these issues, in the past, the national government only has a special bureau called the Entry and the Exit Bureau. If you have come to China before, you'll notice that there's a, in the airport of entry, there's a, what we call entry and exit inspection uh, station. But uh, two or three years ago, because of the immigration, so the Chinese government established a new bureau called the National Bureau of Immigration. So it includes policy program. So what I uh, heard that uh, because we have a group here working on immigration, integration, employment, education, and policy. So the so so it's interesting that uh, last uh, in year uh, 2020, the uh, seventh publishing census, the size of the immigrant 
in China is very, very small, only 1 million. So compared to 1.4 billion people in China, about 1 million, what we call uh, outside of China, main, mainland China. So half a million from other countries, half a million from Taiwan, Macau, and Hong Kong. But uh, remember that uh, the uh, seventh population census was conducted in November 1st, year 2020. So COVID-19 was, was still there. So this number is very much underreported. It's very, very much reduced because of the uh, leave, uh, leaving of the uh, most of the foreigners. So, so, so what I think that uh, immigration is an issue. We have a policy and we have a program. And the government is encouraging immigration, but mostly two groups of people. One, international students. So for, for instance, that, uh, for the major university in China, that uh, the government requires that uh, at least 10% of students should be coming from outside the mainland in China. So, so for instance, in my university, we have 30,000 30, students, but we have more than 3,000 international students. So that is number one part of the immigration, if it's not the official immigration. The second part is mostly called the talents program. So we are using the immigration policy to try to attract business people, uh, people who are, can invest, and also people who have, who have skills and intelligence come to work in China. So, so in the future, we are expect to attract more foreigners who have education and degrees in China can continue to work in China. But uh, the bottom line is that these people cannot be enough. I agree with Wang from this point that Chinese society has been historically very, very inward. So the number of the immigration foreigners cannot make up the decline population. Uh, decline in China. So that's my comments regarding the immigration. Yes, thank you. So we also have a question about um, potential health disparities and differences in access to health care, perhaps by urban rural areas. Um, China, of course, has moved to merge the urban rural um, resident insurance program, but the most generous program is for urban resident employees insurance, um, but what are the additional implications of the changing demographics for differences in access to healthcare and in health disparities? Would anyone like to speak to that? Uh, I'm not an expert on this field, but I'm trying to say a little bit more. Uh, one thing I just talked about uh, urbanization in China, right now it's currently around 65%. Uh, by national, by national planning, development planning is expected to reach 75 to 80%. So this is number one. Number two, the whole system is almost, um, uh, let me try to be politically right. So it, it's almost gone, uh, gone, but it's still there in only in a couple of big cities. So right now that you can, you can go to small cities, you can have a hospital restriction there. So in the future, that uh, probably only around 20 to 30% of people will be living in the rural area, uh, uh, rural area, and mostly old people, old people. That's my observation, because when I go to very remote uh, mountains, uh, far areas of rural area, you go to village, a lot of villages are already deserted. And some small villages, you can only see old people living there, no adults, no children, because children uh, already left with their parents in the cities, small cities, big cities, and medium-sized cities. So this is what we are going to see in future about uh, the, uh, what we call the urban development and uh, what we call rural decline, not in population, general decline in future. So regarding the uh, health program and health policy and the disparity in health care, the problem that uh, we, have, we do have a national program on health, uh, health policy, but it's mostly very much different, different, uh, different, different across major promises and also major, uh, major uh, rural urban areas. The government of China right now 
first right now is try to promote what we call universal pro universal uh, health policy health program for urban areas in different provinces because right now the health program is by province not by national uh, government so this is number one number two is that the we are governments trying to merge trying to merge the rural urban pension system and the health insurance system but it's very very hard so the big issue right now even within the urban area different groups of people have different policies like a retirement uh, pension if a worker if a public servant if a professor your retirement uh, uh, pension amount is very much different so that is what i observed i i i, I do not know very much about uh, uh, health services in rural area and in urban area but i know that the government is trying to uh, reduce the gap but what i observe that uh, the gap might be increased in future increase in future because of the increasing urban population and declining uh, rural population especially the rural population will be more what we call the gendered more women and rural population will be more uh, old because more old people will be left behind in the rural area that's my uh, observation and comments it's not totally responding to the to the question but i'm trying to uh, share with some of, some of my observation and, and uh, comments thank you very much Yes, and you discussed and you showed the increasing disparity actually in sex ratio in rural areas is that rural remaining population is more selective in a in a distinctive group. So it'll be interesting to see how those trends continue. I wanted to also ask Professor Wang and Professor Tai if you would like to comment on this question of, um, well, there's several other questions and we're running out of time, so let me combine some. Um, one is related to the number may have passed quickly, but life expectancy at birth of 77.3. Uh, um, does anybody know what life expectancy in the US was in 2020? I believe it's 78-ish, but yeah. No, it went, went down so in 2020 during the pandemics. So life expectancy at birth in China exceeded I, that in the united states in 2020 yes, yes so again so this is quite a dramatic change and the question is going forward the trends and obviously some of the many of these changes are related to the pandemic but going forward there's a great triumph of longevity and longer lives but then society needs to adjust to population aging as you all have articulated so maybe if i could ask about some of the policy adjustments um Professor Wong has written about um, age of abundance and related to per capita GDP and, and going forward. I wonder if the, as the population ages and if health, if they're healthy longer, do we think they should be working longer? Should there be an adjustment of retirement policies that has been discussed in different places? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, Karen, you are the uh, actually the uh, expert in this group, uh, but let's just let me just uh, uh, highlight uh, uh, one um, background. Uh, you know, when we talk about China's age of abundance, uh, that's really a, a rapid increase in people's standard of living. Uh, but under you know, remember forty years ago, China uh, well slightly over forty years ago, uh, the average food intake, nutritional intake level uh, for, the, for the average Chinese was barely uh, above the subsistence level. It's quite, it's, the food was in shortage, uh, you know, oftentimes. And um, what we should note, though, is that in the last 40 years, because of this rapid uh, improvement in people's standard of living, there was also a change in, a rapid change in lifestyle and uh, in uh, the uh, disease uh, profile, and that's going to play into uh, aging uh, in the years to come uh, prominently. Now, I don't have uh, the figure at hand, but uh, I can you know, basically say that uh, while food, uh, uh, grain consumption even decreased per capita, you look at the meat, uh, you look at alcohol, you look at sugar, look at the dairy products, 
and uh, you look at, uh, you know, look at or cigarette smoking. So uh, those uh, what are called uh, uh, food uh, intake with more health implications um, change more rapidly than just um, the average standard of living that we can look at. So that has implications. You know, Karen, you know this so well. I think in 1990, uh, something like 45 percent of or death were due to what's called NCDs, non-communicable diseases, cancer, uh, heart diseases. And um, by the mid 2010s, uh, the share increased to over 70%, right? And so China is also waiting for a, not just, uh, 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 you know, China is waiting for a uh, diabetes and lung cancer, uh, if we don't use the word explosion, right? So uh, because of the rapid, in, in, again, the compressed process of nutritional improvement and changing lifestyle, uh, China is also faced with not just a larger population, but a population that could have a lot of health issues with uh, you know, you know, non-communicable diseases. So uh, that is uh, something in the background uh, on top of the population numbers of the you know, large number of elderly. Thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on that issue? Sure, yeah, I would like to add, just, you know, maybe one more, one or two more points on, uh, based on what uh, Li Shizhuo and Wang Feng said. I think, yes, you know, it's, in terms of policy, Chinese government is actually doing a lot in many ways, a lot mm -hmm. more than you know uh, people can expect in this country. For example, they are using the collective bargaining to lower the healthcare cost, to uh, lower the medic medical cost, and the, the huge infrastructure like the, the railway system, the the the, uh, the the fast transportation system set up make pe you know people can get it into urban area to get access. But one of the bigger problems with Chinese health is Healthcare, healthcare system is its hierarchical nature. Basically, if you want to get a good care, you need to go to urban centers. It's not that accessible if you are in a, a remote area and rural area. And that you know that that's what why people that there's huge outcry in Shanghai because the, so the entire city is being, is locked down and people used to go to Shanghai to get treatment no longer have that kind of access. So how to structurally adjust that kind of, you know, provide healthcare, distribute more equally across country will be a huge take. Having said that, I think one thing China and probably other governments uh, as well should learn from China's one child policy and other policy issues, governments probably should be a little bit more humble. Try, try don't think, you know, should not think that the policy can solve every, every problem. Like the, the fertility initiations, trying, you know, Look at what Japan has been doing. Look at what South Korea has been doing. Certainly, there's very little success in reverse of the trend. Thank you. So now we're approaching the end of our time. I would just like to invite each of our speakers, if you have any parting thoughts you would like to leave us with about this very, as Professor Li Shizhou was saying, it, there's a lot of complexity and interlinking of all these problems. So if there's a particular aspect you think would like to emphasize or give your parting remarks, we will start in the same order that we did um, speaking. Professor Li Shizhou. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Karen. Oh, uh, is my speaker on? No. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, Thank you for inviting me to participate, and uh, and also uh, happy to uh, see what uh, one of uh, the two professors uh, already shared with us their observations and comments. Uh, um, I guess that uh, it's a huge shift in Chinese society, and especially over the last three years during the COVID nineteen period, and. Uh, in the past, people worried about size of population. In future, and right now, they, they worried about aging. So, 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 so in the past, 
Fan planning is number one. In the currently and future, aging is number one. And aging includes everything we talked about today. Fertility, mortality, urbanization, education, everything. So that's why the government has a national strategy called coping with actively coping with uh, aging. So I hope I hope that uh, the, uh, from today's discussion, we probably need to change about Chinese demography from planning to aging. That's my final comment. Thank you, Professor Tai. I just want to echo what uh, Professor Li uh, Shuzhou just has, uh, has said, you know, a few seconds ago. Yes, you know, I think it's time for Chinese government to change its mentality on um, how to deal with its population. I think for a long time, and I think it's still the case that uh, demographers are guilty as well, you know, not just the government, that we think population more as an instrument. We think about the pros and cons to have a larger population versus to have a small population. We think about say, hey, to solve the labor shortage problem, we need to have more babies. That's the thing. To develop the economy, we need more people into from rural urban area to urban area. That, of course, there are economic and you know, uh, academic articles and research have been done to support that kind of very much instrumental rationalistic argument. But I think most importantly for, from my, what I can say is it, it increases, I think people should think people are people. People are not the numbers. People are, are relationships. We, you know, I think that with the COVID lockdown, we know how important individual connections are. And uh, as I just, just said, government should be humble, should, should not treat people as purely as, as a tool and should give individual choices. Thank you. Thank you. And Professor Wang? Uh, thank you. Um, we've uh, covered uh, so many major aspects of uh, China's demographic uh, changes, puzzles. Uh, I think in the last hour or so, uh, there are still some elephants in the room, uh, one of which we have not uh, discussed. Uh, of course, is uh, the one child policy and its legacies, right? Uh, let me share with you a slide uh, as my way to uh, end my observations. Uh, the last one, I'll do this. Uh... Um, so this also takes, uh, this slide takes us uh, out of China to uh, its neighbors. Uh, so all three East Asian societies, uh, China, South Korea, and Japan, uh, have converged to a very low fertility, about 1.5 uh, birth uh, per couple in the last decade and more. So you can see this, right? They all converged. Uh, yet, if we look at the, comp uh, the composition uh, of these very low fertility, you see a very different picture. Now, this is what we call the parity progress ratio from uh, birth to child. So this is for, it's like a share of couples with one child. So China is on the top or almost everyone, every couple this is up to only 32,000. Almost every couple had one child, but uh, look at South Korea and Japan. Uh, this is per, th per uh, thousand. So on only 70% of Japanese couples, uh, this is you know, more than 10 years ago, uh, had a first child and uh, had a child at all. And only about 80%, uh, in other words, more than 20% of Korean couples did not have a first child. And uh, then you look at from the first to the second child, in China, you see how this dropped after 1980 and it remained very low. We know even after the, uh, uh, even after the, uh, the lifting of the one-child policy, 
uh, most couples stayed with only one birth. So this pattern continues. So in other words, uh, the same low fertility we see in all three countries or uh, three societies, China is very unique. That is the low fertility is largely driven not by couples who have two, three uh, children coupled with no children as in Korea, as in Japan, but with a quite homogeneous one child regime. And that has implications. We've seen this just right now in Shanghai, what's happening uh, and uh, when parents need to be taken to the hospital, need to have someone to get food for them. And uh, so this is going to be a, uh, one of the features, the legacy of uh, China's past 35 years of practice of the one child policy. And so China not only ages, but also it ages with the Chinese characteristic. So I will end uh, my uh, uh, observation there. Well, thank you, all three of you, so much for sharing your expertise with us today. There's so many other things that we could talk about. It's such an important and complex issue, but we'll have to leave that for another time. Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you again, especially to our speakers, Professor Li Shuzhou, Professor Tsai Yong, and Professor Wang Feng. Thank you. Karen, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.